we are live. Welcome to Review and Thoughts, Rogue One, a Star Wars Story spin-off. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, someone built an entire movie about patching up a plot hole in a film that was almost 40 years old at that time, and proved that in addition to making a Star Wars movie, you can make an incredible anti-war war movie set in the Star Wars universe. If you haven't already, make sure to watch the oversaturated hell of the Marvel Cinematic Universe Some Marvel News Phase 2. I've missed seeing Katie and Warmbo, and the special guest was great too. They are a little bit more critical of the MCU than I am, but it's very entertaining, and I don't know that they're really hugely unfair. It's They, they definitely make some, some good points. Now, I don't hate fans of any of the trilogies. I don't think, or, or the trilogies themselves, I don't think fandoms of any of the Star Wars trilogies are completely comprised of people who hate people who disagree or have different values than they do. If you express a viewpoint that goes against what I say in this video, all I ask is that you're respectful, and I will be respectful in my reply. If you write something hateful towards me or anyone else, I'm probably just going to ignore you. Now, I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. Also, if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. See this length. Check the time codes in the description box. I'm currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movies that I watch, so I'm going to speak faster until my back feels better. And... Let's... So, yes, I started this video with a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and... Hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. Also, please note, I will not warn before spoilers for earlier entries in this franchise. Not ones released earlier, <laughs> released later, but set earlier. Only ones released earlier, even if some are set later. As soon as I end the review itself, please note, the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for the movie itself, including discussing the ending. Now, I don't have any personal issues with almost any filmmakers, and I almost never let any issues I might have interfere with my review and analysis. This movie did not ruin my life or my childhood, etc. So, there are several major appeals of Star Wars movies. One of them is they can have many wild concepts, have them play off each other, Magic Power vs. Robots, for example. And, yeah, outside of this kind of thing, you will only have a few at a time and yeah this one does and it's great and another major appeal with their wild concepts they can give a compelling commentary on real issues with greater efficiency than more like mainstream st stuff and yeah I would also say this one does that and I quite appreciate the characters on the same team you know, will will attack together, not just you know fighting as a, a unit, not only individuals. There are compelling interpersonal conflicts between them, and right. So, I personally don't mind when people who aren't fans of Star Wars review them, comment on them. But I know for some people, you know, some some people consider it extremely important that. Only fans, not the website, will, you know, yeah, no one other than fans comment on and review. So I, I do want to make completely clear, I criticize Star Wars, but I am a really big fan of some Star Wars. And yeah, just to briefly, you know, other than this, I've watched episodes one through seven taking them in release order. Movies, episodes 4 and 5 are perfect 10 out of 10 for me. Episode 6 is a 6 out of 10. All three prequels are 5 out of 10. Episode 7 is a 7 out of 10. And so ranking the films from worst to best. Episodes 2, ep yeah. Episode 2, 3, 1, 6, 7, 4, and 5. And by the end of this review, I'll let you know where this one ranks. 
Unless I forget, in which case, ask me in the comments and I'll let you know. Now, content warning and or trigger warning. This movie features the following, and I'm going to be discussing at least some of the po following potentially triggering content. Vigilantism, torture, kidnapping, ableism, gaslighting. murder, genocide, and... right. Now, the, the movie is rated PG-13, and so is this video. And the video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. Most visual gets is when I sometimes act something out. So, Feel free to watch something visual, like clips from a movie, in another tab. I won't mind. I'll know. I mean, I won't know. Of course. I'm not spying on you right now. I mean, I did send dozens of spies, and it did not go well. Many boffins died, and they did not bring me any information. Wait, does that mean that you work for the Empire in this scenario? Never mind. Now, I streamed this movie and thus didn't pay any extra money to watch it, so anything negative I said in this video is not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to what it's adapting. I should have... Uh, to other movies like it, is what I meant to say. Yeah. What I was expecting, trailers and other marketing. Other... Let's see. Yeah, I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I said in this video are for criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. So, in a lot of ways, this movie is like the original trilogy, especially episode 4. So, I'm not going to mention all the things where they're similar. I'm going to talk about the ways they're different. So, I'm not just repeating what I said in my video on episode 4. Now, technically, you don't need to have watched anything else before watching this but there are definitely aspects of it you will appreciate more if you watch episode four first and yeah you know it it is i i feel like they they did a, a good job of not make like the movie's not incomprehensible if you know if this is the first star wars movie that you ever watch it's it's not gonna be like what is even going on I will say there are things that this movie shows that I think you should see for the first time in actually yeah now that I think about episodes four and five now since we're still dealing with the corona I want to say during this video it is possible that I will touch my face I want to assure you I washed my hands since the last time I was outside and I will wash my hands again before going out now, this is my first viewing of this movie. I watched it, you know, I pretty much went right from watching the movie to recording this video. So it is fresh in my mind. And... So... What is the plot? What is the Rogue One A Star Wars story story? This is set shortly before the events of A New Hope, Episode 4, and we see the heroic efforts to obtain the Death Star plans by the Rebels. And yeah, actually, I think you should watch the entire original trilogy before you watch this movie. Not only episodes four and five. You know, both of the spin-off movies, the Star Wars spin-off movies from yeah, from, from 2016 and onwards, have at least one word that means one. So in this one it's Rogue One, the next one is Solo, and or the word rogue in the title. I've been analyzing this for hours. And I've, I've cracked it. There's an employee at Disney who works on these movies. And he is the solo 
rogue employee. Or maybe if you're not a nutty conspiracy theorist, it's just because rogue is the name of the unit they fly. Solo's hands last name. Yeah, that makes more sense. And um, I really appreciate the diversity in the movie. You know, when when they made the original trilogy, there wasn't as much widespread acceptance of, you know, having a lot of diversity in big movies. But, you know, today we celebrate the diversity found in real life. And, yeah, you know, the, the movie, it's not just white people. You have Latina, Latinx, you have Asians, black people. You know, there, there are more women than you you know yeah the original trilogy did not have that many women at the same time and when there were they were disempowered and now Yes, that brings us to the writing. So this was written by Chris Weitz, Tony Gilroy, John Knoll, and Gary Witta. And yeah, that's a that's a lot of writers for, for just one. Now let's see, Chris Weitz has written fantasy. You know, Tony Gilroy is primarily known for his political thrillers. And John Knoll actually, you know, he he is a VFX person and he came up with the idea for this. So he has a, you know, yeah, he, he, he thought up, what if we showed what led to the start of episode four you know how did the death star plans end up end up in the hands of princess leia and yeah it's it's really cool that 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 got made into a movie because it's a great idea and you know for a long time people didn't really listen to like you know if you weren't a director a writer or a producer if you worked on the technical side of a movie, even if you were incredibly talented and had a good idea, you wouldn't, you know, you'd have a hard time finding someone who would listen to you. But yeah, they, it's a great idea and the movie is good. It's not the best thing ever made, but it is quite good. And Gary Witta, other than writing this, wrote After Earth and The Book of Eli, which yeah. Now, I am going to quote a few fellow critics here. The Force persists in its riveting presence all throughout the film's visceral development, a monumental feat that its Tony Gilroy and Chris White's written screenplay is able to preserve even, I suppose... Yeah, I don't think I'm going to read all that. Yeah. Even in the absence of Jar Jar Binks and the iconic opening crawl. Others say it has a sharp script. Some say it has too many coincidences. It definitely, I mean, that is, I haven't watched the other movies in, in the, you know, of the, of the, of the Star Wars movies made after episode three. The only two I've watched by now, as I record this, are the, F the Force Awakens and this. But I have done research on the remaining ones, and it really does seem like there's just there's an abundance of coincidences in all of them. I, I mean, it's a way to keep a movie moving fast. You know, if if they don't have to, 
if if things can just coincidentally work out well that makes it easier and i think that's basically the the reason and i don't think i mean it's probably just in general like big block big blockbuster action movies today you know have coincidences now right so some critics say that it's very obvious that certain things in the movie were rewritten and there were reshoots as it was being made and that really hurts the overall movie and originally the movie was going to be a lot darker than it ended up being that was what the director wanted and Disney ended up thinking it was too dark and hence reshoots some think that Jin is too passive especially in the first act that is definitely true she is our lead our protagonist and she is very passive things are happening to her other people are telling her what to do and you know forcing her hand and yeah that is that is definitely a problem with with the movie now right and another critic says it's a problem for the movie that it's actually it can be difficult to follow the plot because the movie communicates very important things very badly ultimately it's difficult for me to judge that because long before you know there are some movies where I try to avoid spoilers even if the movie has come out long before I watch it this was not one of those cases that's not really I haven't really been doing that with the more recent Star Wars movies so I know I, I've known the overall plot for this for I guess at least a month by now so it's it's really hard for me to say but if I had to try to yeah I think so I think there are definitely things that if I went into this movie not knowing it w I would have trouble picking up all of the th yeah and a, another critic says it's a big problem for the first act that it is a long line of very short scenes that just communicate a very small very little information to the audience and the scenes are not interesting also and yeah that is definitely true it's I I'm not certain if it's because of reshoots that it it's possible that it was just that they had trouble when they were writing the script they had trouble making the first act flow better but I could definitely imagine it might be that originally it flowed better but the scenes were too dark so they had to very quickly write these scenes that accomplish less but get across the important information because it really is like if you just like hypothetically if you watched maybe the first 40 minutes of this movie and then you then you stop you know I'm not recommending doing that but hypothetically if you did it really would be just well you know every scene okay so here's a new character here's something they can do and or knowledge they have maybe someone they know that's important and maybe also a sort of defining like they'll do or say something that gives you an idea of what who they are and then you know this the scene ends really abruptly and move on to the next scene because the just it's really just putting setting up the pieces you know and and it's necessary to set up the pieces you can't start the game before you set up the pieces but ideally you want to be able to set up a lot of pieces more effectively without you know with, yeah with, without it being a lot of really short individual scenes that just like you you barely get a sense of what's going on before the scene ends and then we go to a new place 
to meet a new character, to get a tiny bit more information about the overall thing that's going on. And then again, and then, you know, I, I wouldn't blame you if you stopped the movie 40 minutes in and was just like, okay, this is just, this is, it's exhausting. It's not very satisfying as a, you know, a movie going experience. It's just, yeah. And others said that it, the movie, it's supposed to be a heist movie, but it is not interested in the mechanics of the heist which every good heist movie is, there's definitely some truth to that, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, I don't really have anything to add to that, and, let's, see. yeah, so, another critic, the problem though is that the beginning of this is just painful, particularly if you're fresh to Star Wars. You can feel the screenwriter's hand moving the pieces around for the final confrontation. By the way, I like it just fine. I'll buy it on Blu-ray, which is more than I can say for The Force Awakens, but it's got an extremely stiff, choppy, inorganic beginning and a flabby middle. All the beautiful shots in the world can't mask that. Very true. And... Right, and, and someone else responds, uh, you know, they agree that the beginning is a bit choppy, probably could have been executed better, but I'm not convinced that choppiness is inherently a bad thing, since it serves to do some minimalist character establishment, give a sense of scope, breadth, movement, a foot, show you diverse threads that will come together. I view it more as a feature than a bug for a movie that has a lot to accomplish in limited time. Build an unlikely bedfellows ensemble that is unique, winning, distinct from the Star Wars characters we know, yet at home in that universe. Get you to like them and root for them. Hit at least some of the obligatory fan service demanded of a film where the premise is how they got the plans for the Death Star without overdoing it. Deliver adventure, diversity, people, critters, backdrops, action, and plot momentum somehow be fun, epic, personal, humorous, gritty, emotional, and dark all at once. A film that aims to somehow optimize against those criteria in an ensemble and an animation type context within a conventional film running time and with the weight and expectations of Star Wars looming in the background, I think this acquits itself very well. And yeah, I I I largely agree with that. Now. So now that it's more acceptable in big blockbusters for Shades of Grey, we get a Star Wars film with that. And I really appreciate that. The I love the original I love the first two films in the original trilogy. I have very little negative to say about them. And I don't I'm not saying it's a negative. I I want to make that clear. I'm not saying it's a negative that they are as black and white kind of one-sided you know there's a there's a very clear good triumphs over evil there are good people and there are bad people there might be some bad people that can be redeemed but most bad people probably can't and like the the you know the good people do good things the bad people do bad things we don't really see like there's a there's a little bit of shades of gray with Han Solo, but when you really think about like he's he's done bad things and he's there's you know clearly some some shady stuff in his past, but at the end of the day like when the movie celebrates him is when he agrees to help out to help the good guys you know early on he's very cynical he doesn't you know the the Luke says they're gonna kill the princess and Han replies better her than me. But when the movie celebrates him is when he, you know, when he flies back in the Millennium Falcon to, to you know, help during the trench run. You know, that's when, he, you know, before that, okay, he's maybe cool, you know, but he's not like, he's not someone that you really, the movie isn't telling you you should model your life on him the way that, you know, clearly the movie thinks that Ben Kenobi is, you know, great. Like, there's... 
you know, he's presented as this wise sage who can teach you how to live your life better, you know. But, yeah, this movie came out in 2016, and, yeah, you know, we are very, we're ready for it today, you know. I, a lot of modern action blockbusters have some shades of gray, you know, the, the, you, you'll see good people doing bad things to win the day. You'll see bad people who are sympathetic, you know, and yeah, I, I am, I, th I think that was something that like, at the end of the day, I, I like a lot about The Force Awakens. I think it is largely successful in what it sets out to do. I don't agree with everything that it sets out to do, but, you know, I, I do think it's, there's too much nostalgia baiting and fan service. There's too, I, I, I love the meta textuality of it, but I wish there was more to, to sink your teeth into, you know, it's, it's mostly just, hey, remember Star Wars? You love Star Wars, here's more Star Wars. And I, yeah, I really appreciate this has Shades of Grey. I'm not sure I would really say there was Shades of Grey in The Force Awakens. It, it, any more than was in the original, a little bit more than the original trilogy, with Finn, obviously, that, you know, he becomes one of the good guys, even though he was, you know, a child soldier. But then the movie doesn't really carry through. Like, for the rest of the movie, he and the others are cheering as they gun down and blow up stormtroopers. So, you know, the movie doesn't really... Yeah, it, it doesn't really go through with that. And I think... I think an argument could be made that there could be more Shades of Grey in this movie as well, but I do think that overall it does a better job of following through on the Shades of Grey that it brings up, and yeah, I, I really appreciate that it, it brings them up. Now, in most ways, in pretty much all ways, this movie is better than the prequel trilogy. But one problem that those have, that this also has, is we just, we get too much information about some of the people that we know from the other films, and it hurts our, like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say in the review who, but some of the people from the other movies, you know, now that I've seen this, yeah, I, th I think a little bit less of them, and it's just unfortunate, you know, you, you gotta be careful when you're doing a, a prequel. And and that's another thing. If they decide to make more prequels, I, and I'm, I am aware and excited, there is a, I want to say the character's name is Cassian Andor, prequel Disney Plus series coming. That is great. I am really looking forward to that. If they make more prequels that are very similar to... Well, not, eh. I, I guess what I'm saying is this is the, the right spirit to do a, a prequel for, for Star Wars. In you know one, one of my problems with the prequel trilogy is that you don't... There, you know, the... the there isn't a rebel alliance yet. The, the Galactic Empire aren't in power, so it's not these, you know... I think if I... If the prequels had come first, I think I would have a more positive opinion, but Episode Four came first. Like, the, the... You know, George Lucas defined Star Wars as a small group of, you know, this this small, you know, rebellion using guerrilla tactics against this massive fascist empire, and I get that he wanted to redefine for, for the prequels, and I certainly appreciate that he had, he clearly had a vision for them, I just, I think he went too far away from what the original trilogy was 
for it to still feel very Star Warsy, and that's something where you know this movie. I I don't want more that are like exactly like this because then it's no longer fresh. But this is the kind of I I think this is the way to make Star Wars prequels that work. Set them during the rule of the evil Galactic Empire. Give us perspectives we haven't seen before. And and I really appreciate that. You know, this is the the good guys I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say for sure whether any Jedi or Sith do show up in this film at all, but none of the protagonists are Jedi or training to be Jedi. And I just yeah, I really appreciate that. You know, no no one here is like famous. You know, no one in uh, Or at least they're they're famous in a yeah some of them are infamous but they're not really you know it's it's not this thing of you know like in in the other movies like if if you know yeah the moment that you find out oh Luke is actually you know Luke has a connection to Darth Vader first of at the start we think that Darth Vader killed his father. You know, the moment that, like, if Luke Skywalker went into, like, he could go to the farthest reaches of the galaxy and tell some random person, my father was killed by Darth Vader, that person would immediately freak out and say, Darth Vader, he's not here, is he? Because everybody knows him. And in this, it's like, no, these these are just regular people. And that's, that's, yeah, th this is what we need. You know, back, back then, it was like, yeah, Luke was an everyman, but he did have a he he had a direct connection. You know, early on he thought Darth Vader killed his father, which was true from a certain point of view, and later on he realizes his father is Darth Vader. You know, so it is this like yes, he starts out as completely normal and and easy to relate to, but then you find out oh he's actually part of this huge you know, intergalactic conflict, and he's actually super important, secretly, then it's no longer easy to relate to. That was just, that used to be something that was thought of as necessary, or at least important, for this kind of story, and that's, yeah, in this one, no, these are, these are regular people caught up in this galactic civil war, and, yeah, it's, you know, I'm, I don't know if I would say that they're not necessarily the most relatable, all of them, but certainly several of them are very sympathetic. And yeah, we get a ground perspective on the Galactic Civil War, which really we never have before. You know, the moment that Luke really saw the... When the, when the Civil War came close to Luke, he was already, you know, talking to Ben Kenobi about becoming a Jedi. So it... You know, and at that point, it's no longer this, you know, the, the moment that he's trained to become a Jedi, you get this sense that, oh, he's going to become this big hero. Things are going to work out. And that's just, that th this is very much, things might not actually work out. This is, this is a movie of like, you know, yeah, if you watched episode four, you know that at the end, you know, ultimately it must work out. But it's not really the kind of thing where, like, throughout this movie, a lot of characters are expressing that they really don't, th they don't think it's going to work out. They think they're going to fail. And, and that is, like, that's another thing. When you watch episode four, like, we find out that the Death Star has a weakness, you know, ah, let me think, when the... Ah, I'm having trouble remembering exactly when, but even from the very start of the movie, you have a sense that there is some hope. You know, it's right there in the title. There is a way to stop the Death Star. This is the movie where they don't yet know there's that hope. This is the movie where they're just told, you know, the evil Galactic Empire, the these horrible overlords that are, you know, these, these fascists, yeah, they just got a super weapon, you know, that's, it's, and, and the movie lets that 
lets the weight of that hit. And I really appreciate that. You really do feel like this is this is what it must be like to not be one of the you know few really famous people in this conflict. The ones that either start out hopeful or get hope fairly early on. Now, plot twists. The movie does a decent job handling plot twists, but there are definitely some that are just... It's, the, the movie flies right through them really quickly, and it's just... it They don't have the weight that they should because it's handled so quickly. But I would not say that there are too many or too few or that they're too easy to figure out. Now, this was directed by Gareth Edwards, and this is the only of his movies that I've watched. He directed the 2014 Godzilla movie, which was fairly well received, if I understand correctly. And it also, like, I remember that trailer, you know, it looked like if, if I was into monster movies, I'm sure I would have been excited. I, I'm sure I would have watched it. Honestly, it's it's not impossible. I, I am I'm a really big fan of Elizabeth Olsen now, so it's possible that I will at some point. I, I, I don't like I don't have a problem with monster movies. They're just not really something I'm I'm huge on, but yeah. It's, you know, having having now watched I'm gonna try not to screw up the title. Martha May Wait. Yeah, I think I screwed it up. Marcy Martha May Marlene. I think that's it. You know, Elizabeth Olsen is amazing in that movie. And honestly, I think that movie might have been, like, why she got cast as Wanda Maximoff. Because every single thing she needed to be able to do as Wanda Ma playing Wanda Maximoff, she does in, in that movie. And it's just, it's incredible. Honestly, I am kind of considering doing a video on it because it is just stunningly good and it's on Disney Plus so it wouldn't be difficult for me to get access to it. Gareth Edwards also directed the 2010 movie Monsters which I've heard a few mixed things about. Some people love it, some people hate it. It's apparently like it's kind of impressive for how small of a budget it was made of on, but, yeah. I do really hope that, I, I think, as, I, I think, if they are going to keep making, you know, I mean, so far they've, if they're going to keep making pre, uh, yeah, prequel movies, or Star Wars spin-offs in general, maybe they won't all be prequels, you know, so far the two have that have been released have been prequels. It's, I mean, they seem to be interested in getting very different directors to do them. Uh, you know, they they hired the guy who does monster movies for this one. Then they hired I want to say they're called Lord and Miller, the the comedy duo for Solo. Although ultimately they were replaced, but you know, they, they don't seem to be that interested in just sticking with directors, but if they go back to any previous directors, I think Gareth Edwards has more in him of, of these. But otherwise, like apparently, I'm, I'm not 100% certain, but I've heard that the Patty Jenkins, I want to say it's called Rogue Squadron, you know, despite the, the failure of... Wonder Woman 1984, which is a bad movie. I still have faith in her. I think she has more great movies in her, and I could definitely see her doing well with Star Wars. Now, yeah, I I would I I hope that she keeps that that they do make that move. Although, yeah, with with Solo's performance, maybe everything will be Disney Plus from now on. Which apparently also, I mean, it worked out for The Mandalorian. Or is working out. It's still ongoing, I'm pretty sure. Now, 
quoting from Wikipedia. Based on an idea first pitched by Noel ten years before it entered development, the film was made to be different in tone and style from the traditional Star Wars films, omitting the customary opening crawl and traditional transitional screen wipes. And it it really is like it it was a great idea. This is like when the original Star Wars was made, it was gritty compared to other science fiction. You know, like you know, George Lucas looked at something like 2001 A Space Odyssey, which, you know, I'm not saying it was a wrong choice for that movie, but that movie, it is like this completely clean and high-tech and like just, yeah, almost, almost like perfect looking spaceships and that was that was what Kubrick was going for it's not like Kubrick didn't know how to make something a bit more you know yeah like he he was very capable of making movies that embraced something a bit more gritty and and urban and nasty like with a clockwork orange for example that movie does not feel like it's just completely anyway George Lucas looked at that and said, my future, my sci-fi, and, and actually, yeah, Lucas's other, you know, THX 1138, from what I recall, at, at least parts of it, I'm pretty sure, are also very, like, just this kind of seamless, it's, I want to say the, the white prison, at least, is, but, yeah, you know, when he made Star Wars, he wanted it to be more gritty and grungy. I recently heard someone call it Rust Punk, which is absolutely perfect. And for back then, what, you know, by, by today's standards, that's not, it doesn't look quite as, as dirty as, like, yeah, to, today it, it is possible to get even grittier and grungier. And, yeah, here, you know, in, in part it is the themes and the the characters you know these are characters like i don't think there's not really a character in this that is just completely black and white there there's no character in this that is just 100 percent either good or evil they all have shades of gray and that's you know that wasn't something that george lucas was going for with the original trilogy but this isn't part of that trilogy this is trying to be another story in that overall galaxy and yeah i think that was the right choice that that's yeah like like i mentioned earlier i think episode 7 was too similar in in those ways to episodes 4 through 6 that you know it it didn't go far enough outside of that and this one definitely does and that might also be why like George Lucas was reported to have enjoyed the film more than Force Awakens upon hearing this Gareth Edwards said I can die happy now and I I get it I I too I think this is significantly better in a, not not in all ways but in yeah for, for sure the the introductory scenes for the main characters in The Force Awakens are significantly smoother handled than in this. Now, let's see. I am, right, this is IMDb trivia. Several scenes from the trailers that didn't make it into the finished movie were the result of so-called indie hours. During those indie hours, the crew spontaneously shot scenes to see what results they would get, regardless if they would make it into the finished film or not. In one instance, when Felicity Jones was walking through the tunnel of the Imperial, uh, was, yeah, to go to the next scene, a crew member switched the lights on. Another crew member called her, and she instinctively turned around. Director Gareth Edwards was so taken by that spontaneous composition that he asked the crew to let the cameras roll. He initially asked for ten seconds. They ended up spending half an hour filming about seventeen takes. When Edwards had to assemble the trailer, he included one take on that particular scene. Even though he knew it wouldn't make it into the finished film, he was still proud.
proud of it. Now, quoting some fellow critics, the directing is heavy-handed and uninspired, the plot moves many turns, lots of action, that includes more fight scenes than the side of other movies developed predictably, even if it's not always easy to follow. Now, some say it's somewhat routine, and trading emotion and depth for sci-fi magic and bombast. Rogue One is the start of a darker, more grown-up direction for the saga, and I applaud it. Emotion and depth, yeah, ultimately, that, yeah, true. A highly entertaining mess, the kind of loopy, stumblebum spectacle you get when state-of-the-art visual effects collide head-on with the erratic sensibilities of a, of a mediocre director and the crushing need for a studio to meet a release date. Yes, I. Uh, the movie would have been better if, yeah, with more time. To, I would not know if he's an overall mediocre director. It's it's difficult to determine how good of a director he is based on this since um, you know a bunch of stuff was reshot. It's an experiment that mostly works, but there are moments when it's clear that the task of finding new areas of Star Wars to play with is a bit too much for director Gareth Edwards to handle. This installment isn't about looking backwards. In essence, it's a war movie and director Gareth Edwards keeps the momentum going with a string of stunning set pieces. Still too reliant on nostalgic fan service, but a clear step in the right direction for these new fans of Star Wars movies. Rogue One, directed by Gareth Edwards, with a sharp script by Tony Leroy and Chris Watts. White is a bracing and dizzying marvel, propulsively pitched and even, dare I dare say, moving. Gareth Edwards' technical vision shines through in the battle scenes, but his work with actors leaves something to be desired. True. Edwards pushes the saga out of its comfort zone to offer a complex look at the universe created by George Lucas, making it truly feel diverse and complicated. And some more IMDb trivia. Gareth Edwards instructed the art department to only use elements that would have been available in 1977 to get the movie to look contemporary to Star Wars Episode IV. The flight control animations, for example, had to be kept as simple as possible, resisting the urge to make them too flashy. That is 100%, that is very clear in this movie, and it was definitely the right choice. I am really glad that that was another of my criticisms for the prequel trilogy, is that it does not feel like the technology we see in those movies came before the technology we see in the original trilogy. And, yeah, you know, it's, it's too, everything's too clean and neat and just, yeah. Gareth Edwards named Blade Runner, Alien, Apocalypse Now, and Baraka as visual inspirations of the film's look. I don't know Baraka, but the other three, you can definitely tell. And it was 100% the right, yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I wouldn't say that the movie is just like Blade Runner in the Star Wars universe, Alien in the Star Wars universe, Apocalypse Now in the Star Wars universe, but there's definitely, yeah, visual inspiration, very clearly. And, yeah, quoting fellow critics again, this is one of the first times where we see what the fascist empire, how, how it affects normal people. I like this one, but it did feel like a missed opportunity. I wish they'd gone all in on making this one of the those 50s and 60s World War II films. This could have been a great men and women on mission film and saw Dirty Dozen on Ryan's Express the Train where Eagles Dare the Guns of Navarone. Instead, they had to shoehorn the orphaned hero with daddy issues narrative into the film. That whole speech that Phyllis Jones gives completely fell, fell flat for me, both for narrative reasons and because I don't think Jones was able to pull it off. Jennifer Lawrence would have nailed that moment. I, I do think that it is... The movie would probably be better if... Yeah, Phyllis Jones' character wasn't this... Or, yeah... We, we really didn't need more daddy issues in, in Star Wars. That is that is not something that was required. According to the art book, John Knoll's initial treatment was for more of a lower-budgeted Mission Impossible Guns of Navarone type of ensemble 
espionage action picture. When Edwards came on, became more interested in telling Jin's story. I question that decision. I question the whole load of decisions that were apparently made during the making of this thing. And I basically like the final film. Force Awakens has the characters going from point A to B to C for absolutely no reason. The whole Maz ca castle set with Finn leaving first, then Rey leaving so she could be captured, then Finn coming back, etc. is horrific. I at least on second view understood why the characters were going where they were going in Rogue One. I'm not saying it was airtight, plot-wise, but at least what the characters were doing made some sense, unlike Force Awakens. They needed... Yeah. Not perfect, but it makes more sense than Force Awakens by a mile. This is clearly an uneven film that got focused group to hell. Glad they had the guts to do a film. It's sloppier than the original three films in every way that matters. I think it was Star Wars done in MCU style. This movie is a great example for why we need to stop rating movies in a nerd binary, best or worst ever. It's not good enough to be the masterpiece that one fraction claims it is, but it's not nearly as awful as the other fraction claims it is. I liked it more than I didn't, but acknowledge its plot holes and mostly unmemorable characters. But there is also too much top filmicism on display to call it bad or even mediocre. I already somewhat talked about the opening of the movie. And right, so I'm not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad, but it fits with what came before. I, th I think the movie has a strong ending in most ways. You know, in, in the movie kind of has an uphill battle. Because the ending, I mean, we basically know, like, by the end of this movie, the Death Star plans, you know, must be, like... Yeah, we, we pretty much know that the, the by the end of this movie, the, the Death Star plans must be in the hands of Leia. That's that's pretty much like you know, if you if the movie ends before that point, it seems like, well, why did No, that doesn't make any sense. Just, you know, end ended there. So we as viewers know how it's going to end. The movie really has an uphill battle for making the ending compelling, considering that we know how it's going to end, and it still did. Like the the, I'm not saying that I loved every second of the entire movie, but I say maybe the last hour or so of the movie was really really good, and like everything in the last half hour, I've seen other people talking about it. I've you know, heard it analyzed to death, and just, yeah, somehow it still really worked. I, I don't, there wasn't really anything that I didn't know was going to, to happen, and yeah, somehow the movie really had me gripped for, I'd say the last, yeah, I'd, yeah, I already mentioned the last hour is, is really, really strong. I'd say the last, yeah, the last 30 minutes or so, I was really on the edge of my seat. Like, I, it was just absolutely incredible. Now, that brings us to the characters. Now, this is one of those movies where it simply isn't going to tell you all that much about a number of the characters. If that means you can't get into a movie, this might be a movie you won't be able to get into. And it's also one of those kinds of movies where a number of the characters, you know, there are aspects to them that make them harder to like. Which, again, if that means you can't get into a movie, this is a movie you won't able to get into. Now, let's see. So, yes. Felicity Jones plays Jin Erso, and
and she yeah the the let's see so quoting some critics too similar to Ray there's definitely some some truth to that like it is really I don't know why they felt the need to to I don't like criticizing characters that at least in part help to to make movies more diverse. I don't like criticizing female leads, but this is definitely a case where, you know, it's like it would be one thing if this was like let's say that a Star Wars and Star Trek movie came out in the same year and they both had very similar leads. You know, okay, that you know Different people had the same idea at the same time. Whatever. But this movie came out after Force Awakens. They knew, you know, the, the movies... They knew that that Jin was very similar to Rey. And, yeah, it's just like this... It's one of those things that makes some people not like female characters. Because, the, you know, they're going to look at these movies and be like, so... That's the only way to do a female lead? Well, that's boring. And, yeah, it's just... You know, with, with both of them, the idea is that they have very little, but they still fight, and they can still be a force to be reckoned with. But that's not the only way to do an inspiring and compelling female character. It's just... Yeah... I, you know, as as a quick example, I would say that Wonder Woman, as presented by Patty Jenkins and Gal Gadot, you know, the first solo Wonder Woman movie, she, you know, she's not like she's not alone. She's not like this really. She's she's not discriminated against. She's not like ah, what's the word? You know, she she's a she's a very educated. You know, she like she's literally been trained. Like people have helped her get to where she is. It's it's not a movie that says that you know the only way to be strong is you know because that is like there are a lot of American movies that say the only way to be strong is to be alone. You know, individual individualism. This whole thing of just and it's not. That's not the only way to be strong. Individuals can be strong. But it's not the only way to be strong, and yeah, you know, that's a movie with a powerful female lead who is very, very different from this kind of just, you know, let's let's take everything away from her, let's make her completely alone, and ah, oh, she's still fighting. That is inspiring, 100%, and I'm glad we do have at least some movies that are like that, but it shouldn't be all female-led movies, and it's it's entirely too many. There's... There's way too many of these movies where they don't, it's it's like they don't really trust that they can, maybe they don't trust the audience, maybe they don't trust the their own ability to make a movie about a strong woman without doing this exact thing. And it's just, yeah, it's, it's really too bad. Quoting another fellow critic. Man, this movie would be incredible if I gave a crap about a single thing that was happening is what kept going through my head. I don't know if it was the reshoots or the script or tinkering or the rushed production schedule, but it's kind of a giant misfire. A stiff, uninteresting movie that really never engaged me once. I started the movie off as an excited fanboy. I kept wondering, when is, this going to go, when is this going to get good? And by the end, I'd become the cranky old man who was dreading the next Star Wars movie. What the heck happened? I absolutely loved Godzilla. The movie's scale and monster action blew me away, and I didn't even care about the lack of human element. It seemed to be a deal breaker for a lot of people. Now I see where those people are coming from. This is a movie with a big Felicity Jones sized void in the middle. She's been good in other movies, but here she's uninteresting and charisma free. I guess she's supposed to be quiet and stoic and mysterious, which can work. See Angelina Jolie's minimalist performance and wants it. Very true. But instead, Jones just feels like someone whose character-building scenes ended up on the cutting room floor. They probably were. All we're left with is video game cutscenes of people giving long, long exposition dumps, where she just kind of stands there in giant close-up with either a pout 
or a dumbfounded look. I'm not sure which. She's so laughably underdeveloped that when they pull out the emotional fireworks, let's see. I was like, man, I really, really wish I cared about this. And again, maybe a worse protagonist, but Jen definitely takes the cake as the franchise's least interesting so far. I mean, right off the bat, something feels weird with Jin, how the movie puts us in a position to have to fill in the blanks on our character twice. We see her as a kid meeting Saul. The next thing we know, we've heard she's trained with him and fought with him for 16 years and then had a falling out and then got caught all off screen. I'm not saying we need to see any of this. I'm saying it'd be like if Escape from New York had a prologue with Snake Plissken as a kid, meeting Harry Dean Stanton's character as a kid, and then the movie we know starts. And What we end up with is a heist movie where the heist is vaguely explained and kind of lame. A dirty dozen movie where we don't care about anyone. The supporting cast is fine. Everyone's doing an okay job. Let's see. I don't need my characters put in neat little boxes or anything, but I'd like to know. Let's see. Right. Yeah, there's there's definitely problems with Jin's character and Yeah, yeah. Now like I I was interested in following her character while watching the movie. But once it was over and I'm I'm you know, I, I sit back with like wow, we really didn't find out very much about her. We didn't see enough of, like, I wouldn't say that there's no growth to her character, but I'm not sure it feels very earned. Yeah, there's there's too much telling and not enough showing in the movie. And Diego Luna as Cassian Andor, a rebel captain and intelligence officer, And yeah, quoting a fellow critic, I really liked Luna here. To me, he had a grittiness that was missing from John Boyega or Oscar Isaac in The Force Awakens. I could believe he was a wiry, do what needs to be done terrorist. He wasn't playing the hero. Very true. And that is another thing, you know, the, the Force Awakens played it too safe. I think, yeah, John Boyega and Oscar Isaac are both very talented actors. But they really weren't like the the yeah they're they're too like they're a bit too likable for people who've been in these situations like they're they're too charismatic for for the like they they don't really come across as people who've done the wrong thing for the right reason which you really get with with Luna and let, like from right away like the the moment you see him like you you know that he's he's on the side of the good guys but he's not exactly a good guy himself you know now ben 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 mendelson as orson krennic the director of advanced weapons research for the imperial military i could watch him play the villain in dozens of movies maybe a hundred and never tire of it. He was one of the only legitimately, not ironically, good things about Robin Hood 2018. And he's incredible in the MCU. Just, yeah, really, really... Yeah, he's he's absolutely incredible. And I actually, you know, I, I know people who watched this movie when it came out. And then, you know, when they heard he was cast in the MCU, they were like, oh, he's going to be great. He's going to be amazing. And he really, like... Again, we don't ultimately find out that much. Yeah, I'm going to stop saying that. Just assume we don't find out that much about the the characters. But yeah, he does have, like, he's, he's one of the first characters we meet. And he just has the, like, he's just, it's wild that, like, I've seen interview. He's, he's such a pleasant person. He's, he's not, like, like some, some, some some people who actually 
frequently play villains. Like, if you watch them in an interview, you know, they're, they're kind of, uh, wow. Okay, we get it. They're kind of obnoxious. Uh, selfish in real life as well. And so they just kind of channel that, you know. But, no, he's like, he's the nicest guy. And it's just, yeah, he's he's so good at playing villains. He really just, from right away, you're just like, oh, wow, this guy, he's the bad guy. He's, he, yeah, he's the baddie. And Donnie Yen plays Shirt Imwe, a blind warrior who believes in the Force, said to be one of the Guardians of the Wills, and he is... An absolute inspiration. I, I don't really feel comfortable claiming him as an inspiration to me. I have plenty of, you know, white dudes in movies to, to claim as inspiration. But, he, you know, I can imagine a lot of Asian audiences probably, you know, were so psyched to see such a positive depiction of an Asian person in such a major and important franchise. And... Mads Mikkelsen as Galen Urso, Jin's father and research scientist. I am one of many Danes very proud to call Mads Mikkelsen a national treasure. It really is so awesome that he's doing all these huge American movies and just, yeah. At the end of the day, he, he doesn't get enough to do in the movie, but he is really, really good. As, as usual, you know, I, I, if, if there exists a movie out there where he's not good, I have never heard of it. Like, it, it's incredible how he can play such, you know, characters that are so different from each other and play them all so convincingly and just, yeah. Alan Tudyk plays K2SO, a former Imperial Enforcer droid was reprogrammed by Cassian Andor to serve the Rebellion. He's basically the comic relief. And, you know, so, some people have said it's like if C-3PO was tough. And that's basically it, yeah. And I didn't expect him to be such a fun character. I, I thought it was going to be very like, well, I mean, we already have C-3PO. It's not a huge, you know, C-3PO, part of the reason he's funny is that he's so out of place. You know, he's a butler and he's going on space adventures in a galactic civil war. You know, he's he's completely out of his element, but he comes in handy a lot of times and he's he's always so polite in the middle of these big, you know. So, you know, taking it it makes a lot of sense if if you want some of that. So the the one of the things about him that's really funny is his honesty. You know, he's not really used to just like keeping to himself if he realizes they're in a really bad situation. He's gonna, he's gonna say, "Do you really have?" You know, he's the odds of surviving this kind of thing is, you know. So, so taking that and just having like this more like he's basically, you know, he's a he's a warrior. He's he's there to fight. But he's still that kind of honest, you know, it seems like really obvious, but somehow it works. Like it's he's he's the he's got this kind of stoic warrior thing going, but he's like you know, it's not it's not really that he's like nervous and, and worried about how things are gonna go the way that C three PO is. He's he's it's it comes more across like frustration, like he's these freaking humans, why aren't they listening? I'm explaining to them the odds are terrible, you know. But somehow it just, it works. And the, the fact that he will kick your ass as well as tell you with 100% honesty how bad the situation is, it's, it somehow works. Like, but, but yeah, as comic relief, there are definitely, you know, some people think that they, they go too far to get jokes out of him. Riz Ahmed plays Bodhi Rook, a former Imperial cargo pilot who defects to the Rebels under the influence of Galen Erso. Now, Riz Ahmed was so excited about the role that even after 
he got after they cast him, he kept sending just tons of audition tapes to the director via email. You know, he got his email address, which which isn't like you know when you, when you get that kind of thing, you're you're kind of expected to be to you know it's it's it kind of suggests trust. You know, he's like, I trust you to not you know not send me endless, you know, and, and he was just, he was so stoked, and, you know, you, you can find, the, there's, I, I think they're here on YouTube, I, f I forget, but, yeah, you can see, there's, like, he does so many different versions of this same character and this one same scene, and just, yeah, and he was cast because of his excellent performance in Nightcrawler, and, yeah, I mean, after Nightcrawler, I would watch Riz Ahmed read the phone book. It's, it's, that is, that is an amazing movie, and he gives an amazing performance. He's good in it, like, the thing is, I'm not sure I would say that anybody gives an outright bad performance in this, but they're not really, a lot of them just, they don't get enough to do, they don't get enough chances to show their talent. And, and, yeah, it's, it's not quite like with the prequel trilogy where a lot of the performances are really very stiff and unnatural, but there, there definitely is, like, if this was the first movie that I watched with, you know, any of these, I, a lot of these people I've seen in other movies before. I, I guess, let's see, Jiang Wen, who plays Baze Malbus, I don't think I've seen him in anything else, but the rest of them I've seen in at least one other thing, and yeah, they, they I've seen them give at least one really strong performance elsewhere, so for this, if this has been, had been the first time I'd seen any of them, I'm not sure I would have guessed that they were, like, incredibly talented. I I wouldn't think they were bad actors per se, but yeah, the movie just I mean part of it is there's there's a lot of characters, so no one character can get all that much screen time. Now, Jiang Wen plays Baze Malbus, longtime companion of Chir Inwe, one time devoted guardian of the wills, now a rebel warrior and mercenary. He's he's really great, and the the relationship between him and Jared M. Wade is is really really great. And Forrest Whitaker plays Saul Guerrera, a veteran of the Clone Wars and a friend of the Urso family, who had mentored Jim in her later childhood years. Now Jimmy Smith's Genevieve O'Reilly, Anthony Daniels, and Jimmy V reprise the roles from previous films as Bail Organa, Mon Moth, Mousy Freepio and R2-D2, respectively. And... Let's see. So... Grand Moff Tarkin and Princess Leia Organa are played by Guy Henry and Ingvild, Ingvild Dela, respectively, with the digital likenesses of Peter Cushing, R.I.P., and Carrie Fisher, R.I.P., superimposed. Now, yeah, I have things to say about, I think, yeah, I'll, I'll get into it fairly soon, I'm, I'm pretty sure. But I have a few other things. Let's see. Sometimes characters in this aren't really written and performed in a way that makes complete sense based on what we know or learn about them. Like I, I mentioned, you know, interpersonal conflict. Like some of these characters don't have a lot of reason for, you know. If the movie was just about here's here's a group of 
well-adjusted people that all agree and they're just gonna you know they they they're gonna fight to win the civil war with with tactics that they all agree on you know i mean that's where's the where's the movie where's you know that that might be yeah that it wouldn't be very interesting to watch so they yeah they give them like jin doesn't at at the start of the movie really she doesn't want to be fighting with the rebel alliance and i already mentioned that cassian is willing to to do whatever needs to be done so you know the these are characters that in you know they, they're different from each other and they have different perspectives on how this whole thing should be handled and that's that seems like a great way to start this whole thing. you know that that means that they have to grow and learn in order to function as a unit and ultimately the movie does not really do a good job of the yeah the the growth them them ending up working together as as a good unit i'm i'm not going to give away whether or not they end up working as a unit but i will say that hypothetically if they did then it i i would argue that it wasn't really earned and it, yeah any any characters that that end up working together even though they start out not wanting to work together it wasn't really earned so i'm not giving away who ends up working together now the central star wars movies episodes one through nine are about characters that are important and or whose family are important and yeah this is the first you know yes i realized that this came out before episodes eight and nine but this is the first star wars movie where it's not really about who you're related to i really appreciate yeah this is about normal people you know anyone can be important a hero it's not about your heritage now so quoting fellow critics the characters are uninteresting they don't develop that much over the course of the movie and Jin Erso our lead is definitely the least interesting of all of these characters there are still way more men than women in large roles the movie isn't interested in the audience thinking about all the people who die who fight for the Empire too much fan service it doesn't improve the movie that we meet these characters and visit these places again too many characters we're not we don't find them engaging it's like they don't have any characteristics we know too little about them the last third is quite good a new hope is told from the perspective of two robot slaves this movie is told from the perspective of people who of of jail prison breakers and such uh, yeah people who have been in prison they should not have used CGI to bring these dead actors back to life it is not convincing and it is disrespectful now I, I agree they they shouldn't have and I've seen some people say well if we you know if nobody tried to make these convincing recreations of actors of animation then it would never get any better I understand that perspective in my opinion they should make a test and then if they can't make that test convincing find a different solution until the technology is there for a, a later movie and it is just I I'm not really comfortable with the I, I think hypothetically if the actor themselves uh, yeah if, if the actor agrees and I do, I feel like I I heard that Carrie Fisher's children agreed on her behalf and they know her better than so so I'm not gonna question whether or not they know you know I don't know if she would be okay with it but I I, I don't think Carrie Fisher would I feel like Carrie Fisher is the kind of person that, like, 
her children would not be going around saying things about her that weren't true. She would not be okay with that. So, yeah, I, I can... That one doesn't bother me as much. But Peter Cushing, like, when he died, the idea of using CG to faithfully recreate a person's face... Like, I want to say he died in, like, 1996. Back then, that was just you know science fiction basically no, no one was expecting that to happen soon so I can't even imagine that he would have said you know if someday there it is possible to recreate my face I, I think it's okay you know that that kind of thing and I mean they they did cast an actor to deliver the lines and you know if you watch behind the scenes like he does the you know they, they did the thing with putting all the dots in his face on his face so that they can capture his little movements and such uh, why not just find someone who looks somewhat like Peter Cushing and give them the role and yes I 100% acknowledge Peter Cushing had a very distinct and unique looking face but it just it just feels wrong to to yeah now according to fellow critics since it's a star wars movie of course it is in part about a difficult relationship between a father and his offspring many of the characters do things that are careless and not thought through the opposite of the logical thing to do in the situation I can't help but wonder if maybe originally their actions made sense but the scenes were considered too dark by Disney so they had to very quickly rewrite it and at the end of the day there are some things that you know where they needed well I mean we're going from A to B to C. We can't take out B, then then you know we can't get from A to C without B. So we gotta have B. Uh, there's no good way to do it. I guess we'll have this character do B. So yeah, because it doesn't really feel like it's like I I don't really get the sense that the the people writing this don't understand why people do what they do. There, there are definitely some aspects, especially the backstories, feel like they're, they're very... like it makes sense for what they... Uh, what's the word? like the psychology holds up. Quoting fellow critics, a number of the characters say and do things that go against their backstory and character development in a way that just feels unnatural rather than that they developed as characters. The actors are too restrained. It seems like they should be passionate in these life or death situations and people who are scared of the Empire not being stopped and that they'll have the Death Star for many years. Good actors, but the director limited how much passion they get to show. I like that the ensemble of unsung heroes aspect is central. Jin is clearly the star to the extent that there is a lead star and possibly the least inspired or distinctive character, but I think it works that she's never elevated to some kind of iconic demigod, nor is the film super preoccupied with her backstory for formative years. There's a breadth and momentum over depth and ponderousness approach to storytelling, and I think it's a great choice. This is very much the show don't tell approach. Mads Hannibalson and Jin and Luna and Whitaker and Ip Man don't get a bunch of dialogue or establishing backstory for us. Or at least me to get a sense of their temperament, motivations, quirks, and arcs. This is a fun, cool ensemble film where the supporting characters are all stars, where the mission is the star. There are more cool, earthy, fun characters I would want to hang out with in this one film than in Force Awakens or in the whole prequel trilogy. 
I agree that the characters are thinly drawn, but I, enjoy, I enjoyed them and their chemistry. Felt like I had a sense of who each of them was, what their deal was, and I was reasonably attached to them for all their screen time. Han, Luke, and Leia are pretty simple, constant. What you see is what you get. Characters, are they more thickly drawn, and if so, how? Now, so the dialogue. There's a fairy tale aspect to the storytelling, and at least the initial Star Wars movies that's lacking here. It's compounded because the dialogue in Rogue One is too contemporary slash basic. And I know people like to make fun of lines about power converters and Yoda's reverse structure philosophies, but this just speaks like any other blockbuster. Yeah, there's definitely some some truth to that. It's if if you read these lines out of context, you wouldn't guess that it was Star Wars. And that is something, you know, that is part of the identity of Star Wars. So the cinematography is handled by Greg Fraser, who also DP'd, right, he's, yeah, a couple of movies that haven't come out yet, Doom Part 2 and The Batman, and the 2021 Doom, Vice, Mary Magdalene, let's see, Zero Dark Thirty, Snow White and the Huntsman, Let Me In. So yeah, some, some very distinct, visually distinct movies. The movie keeps it easy to follow when something suddenly happens, like action scenes, and the movie doesn't have hyperactive cinematography when it should be more calm. Now, according to Wikipedia, the film was shot using Ultra Panavision 70 lenses, lenses with Arri Alexa 65 large format digital 6K cameras. Quoting critics here, great cinematography from the first shot in space you see. This is a space scene done the right way. The director puts the shot and lighting in a way so that it all looked as if you actually lived out there. So Rogue One, of course, is a fresh look. This is another camera work. These are other perspectives, and as was rightly noted in trailer analyses, this is an amazing work with scales. The director and the cameraman made things you believe in, believe in the size of the Death Star, believe in the size of the Star Destroyer. Now, bad pacing and transition. In the beginning of the movie, you have the camera jump from random planets without any real explanation as to what's going on, and this type of camera work goes on for the entire movie. It just feels like a bunch of random shots put together. A beautifully shot film, great visuals, there's so many memorable shots in this film and so many of them are shots you want, always wanted to see. For a Star Wars movie that I would say has excellent cinematography. It is filmed so it feels like we are right there in the action scenes. Fantastic use of light and lighting. There are times when Something will move out of the shadow and into the light, and it is glorious. And that brings us to the editing, which was handled by John Gilroy, who also edited stuff like Velvet Buzzsaw, the 2016 Suicide Squad. But to be fair, that you know they did basically force them to edit it like this. Nightcrawler, Pacific Rim, The Born Legacy, Salt Duplicity, and yeah. So again, some very distinctly edited films. It's also edited by Colin Goody, who also edited To Olivia, the show showpieces, monsters, and man that's right, monsters. So the director has worked with the that editor before. And finally, some of the editing was handled by Jabez Olson, who also edited the Hobbit trilogy and the Lovely Bones. 
Yeah, I could 100% understand, like, the editing on the on the Hobbit trilogy, you know, like it or not, but that they do handle a lot of, like, you know, large-scale battles and fantastical concepts. Now, the editing, there, there are some issues in some of the action scenes, but largely the editing does keep it easy to follow fast moving scenes like action scenes keep more calm when that is called for and to be trivia notes that Tony Gilroy was paid five million for 12 weeks work on script revising and reshoots especially on the third act he also recommended the producers hire his brother editor John Gilroy to edit the reshot footage none of the first two trailers footage made it into the final film Nearly none of the footage and dialogue in Rogue One's original reveal trailer made it into the final theatrical cut. It is theorized this was caused by the film's extensive reshoots. And yeah, one critic said that it was too long. More editing was required to make it to to move it along faster. And yeah, uh, there's definitely some some truth to that. The special effects are great, like with the other new Star Wars movies, and unlike the prequel trilogy. Actually, the prequel trilogy does have a number of actual practical effects. It does have people in in suits and and puppets and such for some of the creatures. But unlike the prequels, you know. Yeah, those are also true here and in the other recent Star Wars movies. But unlike the prequels, nothing feels fake in, in this. It all feels like it's actually there. And obviously, like, realistically, some of it can't possibly actually be there. But there is this sense of, of grittiness and just, yeah. There's some really great stunt work. So, parts of the movie were filmed let's say, in London, some in Iceland, some in Maldives, Jordan. So we again have these very distinct settings as expected for Star Wars. So, the action, we have chases on foot and in vehicles, physical fights, shooting, including shooting while in vehicles, and, yeah, I've, I've seen some criticize the, the sort of up-close action, and I do think some of the time, some of the editing makes it a little harder to follow, than was necessary. I, it's it's good that it puts us right there, but sometimes it it cuts a little too quickly. It ends up a little chaotic. But the the grander action scenes all have incredible editing and cinematography. I was never unclear on scale or scope or you know general situation details uh, yeah so the music was handled by John Williams who uh, the, you know the only Star Wars movie that he hasn't scored is Solo and as usual, he really delivers now. Right, and, and this also has some by Michael Giacchino, who's also very, very talented. Let's see. 
apparently see, right composer Alexander Desplat's original score was rejected because of the extensive reshoots to address the tone and story issues this extended the pr production schedule for which he was unavailable due to, due to his commitment to commitments to Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets. Michael Giacchino, his replacement, had only one month to write his musical score. I have to say, I it doesn't sound like he had too little time. Some people did find that it felt rushed. Some tracks of Michael Giacchino's score feature reworkings of John Williams' original Star Wars scores. The most notable of these is the track Krennic's Aspirations which features both the Imperial Motive from A New Hope as well as the slowed down version of the Imperial March from The Empire Strikes Back. This reworking of the Imperial March also appears a few more times throughout the movie. I would say that the music fits the Star Wars universe, but it's more, it has this war film, like, vibe. Like, if you listen to the music from Episode 7, you know, yeah, that sounds like very classical, traditional Star Wars music. This score has this different aspect. I'm not saying that one is better than the other, but I'm glad that this movie doesn't just have the same Star Wars music. It wouldn't fit for the war movie feel. And and vice versa. Like, if this Force Awakens used the score from this, it wouldn't fit as well. We again have great sound design, you know, as usual for Star Wars, everything sounds like something unique. So the movie is two hours, five and a half minutes long without end credits, two hours and 15 minutes long with them. So, I would say the the best element of the film is this kind of anti-war aspect whilst still working as a movie set in the Star Wars galaxy. The worst aspect, I think it's a tie between how choppy and uneven the opening is the first I'd say maybe 40 minutes and then how the 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 characters just like it's not quite there's not enough meat on the bone for for that now I was most looking forward to this like redefining of what a Star Wars movie could be and the movie exceeded my expectations. The trailers do give away too much but they do also give you a good idea of what the movie is like and the same thing for the cover and poster. Posters, uh, you know, if you if you like trailers, covers, and posters for this, you're more likely to also like the movie.
Now, on Rotten Tomatoes, it has an 84% on the tomato meter, 86% audience score. And that's based on 456 critical, uh, yeah, critic reviews and 100, over 100,000 user ratings. With the consensus, Rogue One draws deep on Star Wars mythology while breaking new narrative and aesthetic ground and suggesting a bright blockbuster future for the franchise. Of the 456 reviews, 384 of them are fresh. And users gave, you know, the average rating that users gave was 4.1 out of 5, which makes... Yeah, and, and the movie is certified fresh from the critics, so, yeah. On Metacritic, it has 65 out of 100, and users gave 7.6 out of 10. And the last user reviews I found when I last checked was the 29th of October last year. And on IMDb, it has a 7.8 out of 10 and there are 1903 IMDb user reviews and 719 links to external reviews 30.2 percent voted an 8 20.4 voted a 9 19.9 .9 voted a 7 and 14.5 voted a 10 so yeah, very positively received. The movie isn't particularly violent or gory, but it does fit in some, you know, basically as as much as it can without losing the PG-13 rating. And yeah, there's definitely, I wouldn't say excessive, but it might feel that way if you don't like there to be violence. I, I don't personally... Some of my favorite movies have violence. Some of my favorite movies have no violence. But it is a war movie. It wouldn't make sense. And, and an anti-war movie at that. It's supposed to give you a sense of how awful war is. Now. I recommend Outlaw Vern's written review. Although do note that he swears and uses other mature concepts. In his reviews, the same goes for people posting on his reviews. Now, Jenny Nicholson did, I forget if she did more than one video for this one, but, you know, her, you know, her videos for, you know, for Star Wars and in general are great. And, yeah, the ones she did for this are very worth watching. Now, on, you know, D Disney Plus has this and every other Star, you know, all of the Star Wars movies and almost all of the shows, at least in some countries. And, yeah, this has about 76 minutes worth of behind the scenes. And, yeah, it's it's pretty good. Yeah, so I rate this eight worthwhile additions to the canon out of ten. Again, I'm 100% guaranteed not saying that the entire movie from start to finish is as smooth and, and as well handled as it could be, but the parts of the movie that are really well handled so significantly make up for the ones that are not that it yeah you know when you when you watch the overall movie like yeah if if I had stopped watching after the first 40 minutes and someone asked me you know rating one out of ten six probably five or six but when you take the entire movie into account you know, I, I would say the, the parts of the movie that work really, really well help 
make the other parts better in retrospect, you know. So, yeah. And that brings us to the start of the thought sections. So from here on out, spoilers. Disclaimers. So I I already mentioned that there is going to be a prequel to this focusing on Cassian Andor called Andor and I'm really, really stoked. I, I think that is he is one of the most compelling characters in this, and I mean, saying that we know too little about we every character in this, we know too little about them, you know. But yeah, like, you know, one of the only things we know about him is he has been in this fight since he was six years old. And that's going to be really interesting to, to see him going through, you know, him, him fighting, him gradually being willing to do more and more awful things to ensure their victory yeah and I look forward to watching the next Star Wars story I I think that I've heard some say that Solo is nowhere near as good as this but I do think this makes I th I'd be more I, I don't know exactly what the plans are for future movies set in the Star Wars universe, but I'd be more interested in these kind of, not necessarily one-offs, although I'm glad this is a one-off, but at least other th threads, other story threads, ones that don't have anything to do with anyone who has the, who has Skywalker or Palpatine as their last name. It's like enough already. You know, I th I think personally I think we had enough when we had three movies about Skywalkers and Palpatines, but yeah, no, you know, then we got the prequels and and sequels. It's just I I'm more interested in Star Wars stories. I do hear that the Disney Plus series are even better than these two Star Wars story movies. And I could imagine. I, th I think that is probably the best place. The moment that you have an ongoing series, it, you know, the, the pacing can be completely different. You can take your time. And, yeah, I think that's going to be... I, I would be upset if from now on everything everything Star Wars was either on Disney Plus or like video games or other media or something. Now let's see. So, the rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some is analysis, some is M MST3K riff tracks, and other jokes. Now, the time codes for all the sections are in the description box. And the section right after this one is thoughts on how while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. And the section after that is thoughts that I have before watching. And. Right, so, does the movie appear to have empathy for the least likable characters? And whether it does or not, do I think they made the right choice? Ultimately, Krennic... Krennic is probably the closest we get to a completely black and white character in this. There's really... he's... <laughs> Alright, I suppose... possibly... I'm blanking on his name, uh, Tarkin. They're probably the closest. And they're both kind of 
over, you know, like greedy and ambitious. They want the yeah. I I wouldn't really say the movie has empathy for them, and I think that was the right choice. And the movie also doesn't have empathy for Darth Vader, but he's like he's in so little of it, and he says and does so little that where there could be room for for empathy for him so and yeah I, th I think they made the, the right choice I saw someone say that we now we like you know based on now you know once you watch this movie it feels like Leia was kind of stealing the thunder of Jyn Erso and all these others you know, for for this whole thing of like, you know, it's almost like she took credit for getting the Death Star plans when, you know, there was this huge battle in space, and all these rebels who ended up dead, and like, you know, Leia got the the plans in her hand, then she you know stunned one stormtrooper. I forget if she stunned him before she put the plans in, but, you know, put the plans in, stunned the stormtrooper, then got stunned herself, and then, you know, the... Yeah. It, it wasn't... And, and I don't... Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, I guess it's it's almost impossible to not... Yeah. If, if you're gonna tell a prequel and you're gonna do it so long after, you know, like hypothetically, the other way to do it would be if they had made this movie, you know, I don't know, 19, let's, let's say that George hadn't stopped making them. Let's say he made this movie in 1986, you know, so three years after, because back then he made a new Star Wars, a new Star Wars movie came out every three years then you could have just had Leia be the action heroine she could have played the Jyn Erso role but you know obviously she couldn't have when they made this you know due to her age and it would have felt really awkward if the whole movie you know someone else is running around with de-aged Carrie Fisher face so yeah and someone also pointed out you know now it sounds like Tarkin took credit for the Death Star in episode 4 and yeah and and it doesn't yeah it, it makes their character less like I mean I, we're not really supposed to like Tarkin but he didn't really strike me as the type of person to, to take credit for someone else's work. And I, I have things to say about Darth Vader. That'll be in the, in the final section. I appreciate that the movie, you know, the female characters in the movie are not treated as disposable or useless and the non-white cast members are not treated as dangerous because they're different you know really in in this movie if you're if you belong to at least one minority, you're probably either a civilian or one of the good guys. Now... I think the movie does a good job of... like... the various action scenes, It's I always felt a sense of threat and danger, the, the kind of thing that I felt, you know, lacked in Force Awakens because after a while I realized, well, you know, they're always gonna like. Obviously, we we 
our guess is always going to be, oh, they're going to make it out of this movie alive. Cause, or, or at least they're going to get to the end before they die. You know, they're, we're not expecting, like, all of the good guys to die early in the movie. But in Force Awakens, like, it'd be like, you know, only so many enemies would show up that they could fight their way out. Or so many would show up that there's no way they could fight their way out, so they don't even try. And now the bad guys are taking prisoners, where before they shot to kill. And that just means that someone else is going to come in to rescue them, you know. And it just, it didn't feel like that here. The The action felt organic. It felt real and visceral. And I also thought that Boar Gullet was very convincing, like, what's the word? You know, I, I feel like every Star Wars movie needs to have at least one... It was just, it's just, it's the rules, you know, if, if the movie doesn't start with the, you know, a, sh a shot in space and then pan onto a planet or a spaceship or something, and if the movie doesn't have a, a horrifying creature that's in some way a threat, or appears as a threat to at least one character that we're sympathetic to, Without that, it's just not a Star Wars movie. You know, I don't make the rules. I just think them up and write them down. And that brings us to the next section. Notes taken while watching. So, from here on out, spoilers. Yeah, just in case you skip to here from the start of the video. Spoilers for the movie and any Star Wars movie that had been released by the time this got released. I personally think it works well for the movie that there's no opening crawl, that it just goes directly into the movie. I love you, Stardust. Yeah, sounds like a pretty great movie. Like. Deez Deacon certainly made it sound good, yeah. A man of your talents. He is a man outstanding in his field. And Jin's father is taken by the Empire. Her mother is shot. And she comes to the chilling realization that she is the lead in a Star Wars movie. Parents being alive, close to their offspring for very much screen time, and having a healthy relationship with their offspring are just not allowed. You might get one or even two, but never all three at the same time for more than, I don't know, a minute or two of screen time. Okay, so that's a slight exaggeration, but certainly not very much screen time. Especially if the child is an adult rather than a child. And one of the first things, one of the very first things we see Cassian and Andor do is shoot one of his allies because it's either that or leave him where stormtroopers will find him and he worries the guy will give up information. That is a very strong, like if just, if the scene wasn't so short and contributed more to the narrative, it would be great. But that is really like... He's he's literally willing to shoot one of his allies in the back and just yeah. The stormtroopers are literally asking the, the civilians for paper, so we're really seeing the fascism on full display. Jin is so used to having to fight herself out of all situations that even a rescue attempt leads to her fighting the people trying to rescue her. I agree that it's funny that KSO punches her in the chest and congratulates her on being rescued, but in his defense, she was fighting off for other rescuers. And no, obviously, you know, violence against women isn't funny. It, it wouldn't be funny if she was terrible at fighting herself. 
But if, like hypothetically, if the first thing we saw of her as an adult was her getting hit, that would be really gross. But we see that you know she's able to take out grown men, you know, men that are bigger than her with ease. And I also I love how there are people whining about how she's able to fight off men that are bigger than her when she's like clear she's using a metal shovel to do so at that point a huge difference in muscle mass doesn't that make that much of a difference like take a shovel to the face doesn't matter that you're bigger than the other person and her rescuers were not expecting her to fight them and we find out that saw is now an extremist and the Rebel Alliance have problems because of his extremist tactics. So early on in the film, KSO 2 and Jin Erso don't care about each other's safety, but by the end of the movie, KSO 2 sacrifices himself to save her and Cassian. I mean, ultimately. Yeah, I I don't I wouldn't really say that it's com that the movie completely earns that. So, I don't have a lot to say about Bor Gullet other than it is absolute nightmare fuel. It cuts from Riz Ahmed sounding like he's about to scream or maybe starting to scream to the noise of tie fighters which does sound like screaming. Early on, Jin Erso doesn't feel hope. Later on, she will. Later on, she will. I have heard some say that they don't. They didn't feel like it was a credible change. Yeah, I. I can't help but wonder if it was in the original. And then, oh, bug. And then was you know in in the reshoots it didn't survive. Maybe the thing that gave her hope was disturbing to watch. We have to hurry. This town is ready to blow. Well, maybe you could take the initiative and blow town. Jin sees a crying child caught in the crossfire and risks her life to save this complete stranger probably recognizing herself in the child and it's also you know I think it was maybe Phil Mento who said it's like a save the cat moment and yeah very true because it is like up to that point she hasn't really done or said anything that would especially endear us to her but who's gonna dislike her for when she saves a child at the risk of getting hurt herself I quite like that the, the you know because the people working for Saul are causing problems for Cassian and the other rebels, Cassian just shoots one of them instead of helping them fight the stormtroopers. You're right. I should just wait on the ship. Okay, which smartass changed the difficulty to very easy when I was AFK? Seriously, like it really is, you know. He, he just shows up and, like, throws a grenade and just, yeah, it's it's like, or, or a tutorial level, maybe, where they're, you know, they're just teaching you how to fight the bad guys. So there's no real danger yet. Cheered him away is an absolute badass. The shared history of Saul Guerrero and Jin Urso is legitimately compelling, but it would be a lot more effective if we'd actually seen these things instead of just being told that they happened. The performances are great, but this is a lot of telling and not showing. And in general, you know, the yeah, the first 40 minutes or so of the movie, I stand ready to destroy the entire moon. So, this is nothing like the time he mooned an entire destroyer. I'm the pilot. I'm the pilot. I'm the pilot. Great. Somebody accidentally spammed copy-paste in the script. 
Holy crap, the Death Star created a total eclipse of the heart, I mean of the sun. So in the original movie, episode 4, they do a quick effect when the Death Star destroys Alderaan, because that's what the story called for, a quick effect. But here we see this gradual building destruction when the Death Star is tested on Jeddah. I, I really love, again, I'm not saying it should have been different in the original, you know, it wouldn't have made any sense. It wouldn't have worked for what the movie was doing, but, and, you know, that's just briefly going to bring up Episode 7 again. In Episode 7, like, I mean, what was the difference between the scene there and then in Episode 4? We, we briefly saw the people on the planet before it was blown up, but we don't know anything about any of those people. It's not even the home planet of any of the major characters. Like, it blew up more planets at once, and we briefly saw the people right before they got blown up, but that's it. Other than that, it's the same. Why not just go and watch the original movie if you're not going to do anything different? But here, like, they actually outrun a, you know, not 100%, you know, the, the yeah, the, the Death Star being mostly done kind of thing. Just, yeah. And I really appreciate that in the several, sh like, when we see, you know, let's see, I guess it's, is it twice in this movie? Let's see, there's Jetta and there's, they're at the end. I guess those are the two, yeah. Each, both times in this movie that we see the Death Star blowing up a planet. We see, we get at least one shot where it looks like this big mushroom cloud. And where, like, it's close to characters that we are at least supposed to care about. No, I cared about them, not everybody did. So, it, it, like, it's it's almost like saying, I, I mean, it has this sort of anti, uh, what's the word? This, this message of an anti- nuclear missile thing, you know, which, you know, that might be one of the things that George Lucas really likes about the film, because, you know, he he is anti-war. Or at the very, very least. I, I, I'm, I can't say for sure today, but he definitely was when he made the original trilogy. I stayed on the ship, just like you told me to. That's what you get. But there is a problem with Horizon. There's no Horizon. Oh, it is beautiful. Okay, so he's not Oppenheimer. Seriously, though, I do appreciate that we have the equivalent of Oppenheimer and Galen Erso. Whatever you might feel about the idea that the Death Star weakness was intentionally built in by a disgruntled employee, the idea that at least some of the people who built the Death Star end up Regretting doing so is a legitimately interesting idea for a story. I've seen some joke that it seems like Baze and Chinwe. Wait, is that Chir Emwe? That's it. Are like a couple. They bicker like an old married couple. I agree, and it's legitimately funny. I don't know if it's a sexual relationship, but that would obviously be perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with homosexuality. Obviously, if it was, if it is intended to be read as gay, it would be great if they made that representation more clear in the film. There's entirely too little positive depiction of homosexuality in media. Hold on tight, we're coming down low. You call that a landing? Does he look like a killer? What? What ain't no planet I ever heard of? Do they speak Galactic Basic on what? And Jin realizes this man is about to murder her father. We've come too far. Well, I happen to think that we haven't come too far enough. You said we came up here just to get a look. I'm here and looking.
very well. I'll consider it a group effort then. Well, technically, Jack did the bare minimum. He expects to get an A because the rest of us worked hard. I've heard of a slap on the wrist, but Galen just gets a slap in the face. Everybody else gets shot. Man, those other guys should have considered conspiring. I don't know if the movie does the best job with it, but it's cer certainly it is interesting that Cassian... Let's say... Right, yeah, you know, Cassian, one of our leads, wants to kill the father of Jin Erso, our other lead. And while she wants to be reunited with him. And while he's willing to do anything and everything for the Rebel Alliance, she barely wants to participate at all. She had to be forced into it. I'm okay with the explanation of the reason K2SO is so... Did I call him KSO2? Yeah, I voice type these notes and sometimes it gets it wrong. That's right, K2SO, that is his name, I'm almost certain. Anyway, I'm okay with the explanation that the reason K2SO is so honest is that it is a side effect of the reprogramming. But I do quite enjoy the idea that every single Imperial droid is that honest all the time. And stormtroopers and Imperial officers are constantly frustrated by that. You were not summoned here to grovel, Director Krennic. You're here because the filmmakers couldn't resist putting Darth Vader in the movie, even though there's, there's nothing that I'm doing that Governor Tarkin couldn't do. Grab anything that is not nailed down, including the nailing things down machine, which, though it is used to nail other things down, is not itself nailed down. Genevieve O'Reilly is so good at playing Mon Mothma. I'm really glad she got to do it in this movie. She did an incredible job in episode 3, but, you know, her scenes ended up on the cutting room floor, and that was not her fault. Like, she legitimately gave a really good performance. So I guess the idea is supposed to be that... Right, well, yeah, when Jin saw a planet destroyed by the Death Star and her father die right in front of her that inspired her to have hope to give monologues and to fight for the rebellion and yeah it just doesn't feel earned like it I'm I don't think I could say it any better than Jenny Nicholson does so I wanna say her the video she made Putting that I was called Jin Urso Auditions or something like that. And she also did a video called Top 10 Worst Reasons You Liked Rogue One, which is also really good. So you're looking for a manifest. It's just down here, and when it cuts back, they've knocked out the stormtroopers and other personnel. Very nicely done. K2SO accessing the memory of another Imperial droid to get information is a neat alternative to R2-D2 accessing mainframes and computers and such. It's not that one of these two are better, one of these two is better than the other, but it's nice to see something different. I'm not the first person to say, but this is a really cool climax, both the fighting on the ground and the space battle. And it really felt like it had stakes. Like, at first, it felt like, oh, wow, there's no way they're going to win this. Like, there's just way too many, you know, there's too many of them, Sid. It's just not. And, and then they came up with this really clever idea of pushing one of the Star Destroyers into the other one. Such, such a clever, like, and it didn't feel, you know, and it's not like this super intuitive solution. It's not like, well, why didn't they just start with that? Really cool reveal on the AT AT. First you see through the smoke, then it comes into full view. Let's see. 
we have rebel ships. Get Admiral Goran immediately. He's the funniest Imperial officer in the entire fleet, and we can really use him cheering up right now. Bodhi, tell me you're out there. Tell me you've got truths right there. I used to think that Hoth was the most hopeless situation the Rebels faced against AT-ATs, but this is even bigger. It really, really great. I, I mean, at least, at least on Hoth they had a base. You know, they were evacuating people, but here it's just like, I mean, what are they gonna do against these? And it's cool to see the AT-ATs in a, such a distinctly different environment. This kind of beach head thing, you know, tall trees and such. And there was also, in an earlier scene, an ATST like, patrolled city streets. That's the kind of thing. That's, you know, fascism. Like, literally tanks patrolling the city. Like, it would be one thing if, like, if you see a tank and it's moving, that should either be, like, a military base or a an actual military operation like it'd be one thing if you saw there was a city and a tank well maybe there's another tank an enemy tank you know nearby so that's why but no it's just yeah the alien fires some kind of blue energy blast at the 80 80 legs and they crumble another cool alternative to what we've already seen it's not quite tying their shoelaces together, but clearly the legs are the weakness of the AT-ATs. You know, you don't want to attack the head. It's heavily armored and it'll shoot back. Finally, the rebels went over there. Kiju, what's going on? There's one. You have to admire Kiju Ezo's dedication. He keeps failing to convince Imperials that he's still on their side, but by golly, he's gonna keep trying. I feel like people who just hate this movie forget the climax, and people who love it unquestionably forget everything before the climax. K2SO presses the button, which makes a green light glow, telling Cassian exactly where to use the claw machine. Right as he's dying, K2SO explains exactly what they need to do. He's all in now. He's no longer talking about odds. I've seen some say that they didn't care when they saw major characters die in this movie. I would say that I cared each time. I didn't always think that, like, I agree that they should have given an explanation as to why Saul stays behind. And I, I saw someone say all it had, like, you could have just said he can't escape because of the robot legs or something. Yeah, that really is. Yeah, that would have worked, but he just... What did he say? I'm I'm done running or something. Yeah. Jin and Cassian jump and start climbing because this is now a Prince of Persia level, and I am here for it. Chirit Imwe is dying and Baze repeats the prayer and inspired by him Baze tries to make his way while repeating the prayer and does pretty well for a while Jin Urso barely gets through the iris before it closes again yeah this is definitely Prince of Persia I hope she has enough sands and saved fairly recently I really love them pushing one of the Star Destroyers so that it crashes into another Star Destroyer. Just, it's it's epic, and that is definitely a guerrilla tactic. 
they're using the fact that their enemy is a lot bigger than them against themselves. Like, hypothetically, if, you know, like the Imperials wouldn't be able to do that against all these small X-Wings that the Rebel Alliance have, you know. But because the Star Destroyer is large and slow, well, if you push one so it crashes into another one, you know, just, yeah. Because if you just fly at it and shoot it a bunch, that's going to take forever, you know. But the moment you push one of them into it, it just, yeah. I guess I'm going to go ahead and give the movie the benefit of the doubt that Cassian found another path up there because there is no way that I am buying that he, you know, with his wounds, somehow he managed to get all the, he managed to get through the iris without getting cut in half. I like Krennic's final scene where he's defeated. Vader arrives to see all the damage the rebels managed to do and he's like I left for five minutes! I will talk about Vader attacking the rebel troops in the next section. I forget who it was that said that they were glad that Jin and Cassian don't kiss at the end but I definitely agree with them. So let's see. That brings us to the final section. There it is. Notes taken before watching. So Quoting the fellow critic here, the uh, Chirrut Imwe, the character of Chirrut Imwe, is basically a Jedi in a movie that's about how difficult, how dangerous and difficult it is for the good guys in a time without Jedi. And yeah, one one critic said it's not a war movie; it's a Star Wars movie that ends with a war scene. I I get what they mean, but I would. I maintain that it is a war movie or on the whole. Now I understand the appeal of doing the scene where Darth Vader completely dominates a bunch of Rebel Alliance soldiers, but it really stands in stark contrast with how he moves and uses his lightsaber in the original trilogy. I wish they had been able to restrain themselves, especially considering that in a number of other aspects they did. And, you know, for example, this thing of, yeah, the I already mentioned Gareth Edwards instructed the art department to only use elements that would have been able in 1977. Now, quoting Wikipedia, Variety held the Vader reveal, noted the emphasis of the production was much more on the kinetic depiction of large battle sequences and full-on warfare, comparing it to Francis Ford Coppola's 1979 Vietnam War epic, Apocalypse Now. And quoting through fellow critics, stepping back from the space battle, the third act has a terrific ground level fight. This is where the war tone was heavily prevalent. This was a scene where we see a scene we see in a World War II war film with the Star Wars skin. There's no better way to describe it and that is a good thing. What really enhanced the way the war toned ground fight was how well it was edited between the action happening on the ground and the spectacle of a space battle happening above them. Too much fan service, it doesn't make the movie better. And, oh, right. All right but, yeah. A number of things that the characters do, in fact, most of them, changed nothing in the plot. Tarkin should have been replaced with Darth Vader. Others do say it would have been, he would have taken over the whole movie. Jin Urso doesn't get enough to do in the film. The movie is in part communicating that you 
should care about politics like this is just completely off the top of my head but hypothetically let's say that a once in a lifetime election happened with the two least popular candidates and as long as popularity has been recorded maybe just maybe hold your nose and vote for the lesser of two evils too much planet hopping for the kind of story this is they should have set the whole thing on a single planet it feels like the planet hopping is there because it's Star Wars? We expect it. Why is there a tentacle monster there to torture and drive mad the pilot when he's not mad after that scene? They could have implied normal torture. You don't have to show it. Too many important things about the characters are we're told not shown. The actors have chemistry, but it's not enough. And their relationships with each other are not credible, not explored enough, or not interesting. The problem here is this movie had no characters who in real life would actually be capable of starting a rebellion against such long odds. We're told Saw is an extremist. Let's see, we're told Kazan. Uh, Watch the Sorrow and the Pity. Rebellions are made by people who are a little bit nuts, not people who are like, I had a bad dream last night, and now I'm not sure it's okay to shoot Nazis anymore. I think this is why the f movie felt a little bloodless. Also, the music. The characters I watched in the first two thirds of the movie would not have been able to pull off the fight in the last third of the movie. I'm pretty sure all the stuff of Jen's father was added in the reshoots. Go back and watch the teaser in the first trailer. Why do we have different terms for these? Her father is nowhere in either of those. And instead the rebels just tell her they have a mission for her. They already know the Empire is about to test a weapon. They want her to find out what it is and how to destroy it. Frankly, that sounds like a better version of this movie to me. Jin is not an interesting character, and the story with her father adds nothing to her character or to the plot. All of those scenes just add time to a film that already drags. Does anyone else think Tarkin was just a tad trigger happy? Destroying the Jedi City was obviously a jerk move, but then he blows up the Imperial Central Archives, which I presume the Empire still kind of needed hundreds of zone troops just to finish off two rebels a little bit of an overreaction if you ask me I mean when all you have a de it, when all you have is a Death Star everything looks like Alderaan I like Rogue One but I have to admit that the characters while they have some cool things going for them were very poorly developed I was only really sad when K2 died okay also cheer it but his friendship with Baze could have been more fleshed out a lot more. Baze had, Baze had like three lines in the whole movie. And I have no idea what to think about Jin and Cassian. It was nice to see about movies about movie about nobodies, but they weren't that interesting nobodies. I don't mean to be that guy, but I know that if I don't say this, someone in the comments will. No, this movie does not really work as a standalone. If you watch this movie and you didn't either already watch A New Hope or you don't watch A New Hope afterwards, it's not going to be a satisfying, fulfilling story. Personally, I don't think that's a problem. A New Hope is one of the best movies ever made. I've watched it dozens of times, probably will watch it dozens more. But it's just kind of silly to claim that this movie stands alone without A New Hope. And I've, I've seen people actually make that claim. If you don't know A New Hope and don't know what the ending of this leads to, you could argue that the ambiguity works well with how the entire movie is about how hard won even small victories are. I understand that perspective and respectfully disagree. I feel that after all that happens in this movie, you should know that it leads to victory. I'm not saying they should have shown that victory in this movie. I'm saying if you watch this movie and you haven't watched A New Hope, watch A New Hope. When Darth Vader says prepare a boarding party, I almost jokes joke which which kind of party like a rave or 
but then the scene is lit like a slow motion rave, so it's less less of a joke and just more of a fact. I appreciate that the movie ends with basically every single good guy character dying. They just barely had time to complete the mission, and it will lead to the Death Star being destroyed, and, you know, long term the Rebels will win the war, but a lot of people won't live long enough to see that, even though they were an important part of making it happen, and that's a lot like real war. And this is a war movie. Some of the best war movies end with the good guys dying in. I obviously can't give examples without spoiling them. You are the daughter of Galen Urso? Yes, he's my father. And that is it for this video. So why don't you go to the comments below, let me know what kind of prequel or Star Wars spin-off you hope to see in the future if you think it should be theatrical or it should go straight to Disney Plus. If you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two, or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie and recently reviewing thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time.